Okay, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this meeting of the Conservative European Forum. Uh, before introducing our speaker for this evening, um, can I first of all say that um, Lord Ricketts remarks will be on the record. Uh, so um, just to be to be aware of that, uh, and that will also apply to the <laughs> Q&A session. Secondly, um, for, for anybody who's not taken part in this kind of uh, event before, um, we'd invite people who, when we get to questions, either to put a virtual hand up or to flag in the chat um, that they would like to come in, um, or probably both if possible, because I, I don't have you all um, visible on a single uh, screen. Uh, and then we will come to as many people as we possibly can in the in the time, and we will come to you. You can unmute, you will be able to unmute yourselves in order to ask your question <clears throat> once once I have called you. Um, as always, I shall aim to close the meeting uh, at uh, seven p.m. So we have one hour in total. Uh, finally, um, on the thirty-first of January. We'll be delighted to welcome as our speaker Radek Sikorski, the former foreign minister of Poland and uh, quite a noted author in his, his own right. Um, so we have we're yet to confirm the time with Radek, but I think that should be a very, very interesting meeting. He was Polish foreign minister. I remember you know, working with him on the Foreign Affairs Council uh, during the Ukraine crisis of 2013. 14. So I think in particular some of his perspectives on Central Europe, Russia, Ukraine and so on could be, could be fascinating. Um, but I'm delighted today to welcome Lord Ricketts, Peter Ricketts, as our guest speaker. Um, you will, I'm sure, know about Peter's very distinguished diplomatic record. Uh, but I mean, I, my personal memories are, are that um, you know, he was the uh, permanent secretary who greeted me at the, when I arrived at the Foreign Office as a minister in uh, 2010, after the coalition government was formed, and then almost immediately was was uh, plucked away. So he didn't have to sort of tolerate my company for, <laughs> for, for long um, to serve as the first national security advisor to the prime minister under the new arrangements that David Cameron, the coalition government had created. And then Peter moved on to serve after stepping down as NSA, as our ambassador to Paris. Um, and so I, I can think of no one better qualified to give us for some perspective on France, uh, on the, the, the approach to the presidential election later this year, and the position of France in European and international matters, including its relationship with the United Kingdom. Peter's gonna speak for about 15 minutes uh, and then we will open the floor up to questions for the remaining time. But Peter, again, you are most welcome. We're very grateful to you for speaking to us, and we look forward to, to what you have to say. Well, thank you very much indeed, David. And I'm um, sorry we can't all be together in person, um, but it's uh, great to be able to uh, talk about that extremely wide agenda um, uh, with you all this evening. Um, in preparing for it, uh, I was thinking that the state of UK-French relations, I think, is probably the worst I've known it in 40 years. Um, there I'm talking about governmental relations, because um, when people talk about UK-French relations, there's also an enormous iceberg of relations that aren't governmental. Um, the people-to-people -people links, the friendships, the family links, um, the cultural links, education, sport, music, enormous to and fro below or different to the government level, which goes on um, as it always has done. But at the government level, I think things are pretty bad at the moment. And of course, you know, if you take a thousand year view, it, there have been ups and downs in the UK French relationship pretty regularly. Um, and it always comes back in the end to a pretty close relationship. But I mean, I remember as ambassador, um, I went to the 600th anniversary of Agincourt in 2015. And Agincourt, the French have more or less accepted now, and that's sort of water under the bridge. But Waterloo is still <clears throat> quite a sensitive uh, issue. We're not at anything like those uh, periods of our history, but, but things are bad. Um, and I think at the base of the problem, 
um, is Brexit uh, and the impact that Brexit has had, um, not just on our relationship with Europe, but on, on specifically UK-French bilateral uh, relations. I think in London, probably the government would say that they've seen uh, Emmanuel Macron as um, the leader of the awkward squad throughout the Brexit negotiations, always at the hard end of the spectrum in, in pressing uh, for the interests of the EU, for the integrity of the single market, and indeed he has been. I've never seen that as, as a wish to punish Britain for Brexit, uh, although Macron and his government, uh, I think, were, were shocked at the outcome of the referendum. It's anathema to someone with the sort of European passions that Emmanuel Macron has, that any major country could want to leave the EU. And I think it's also fair to say that the French government were very surprised and rather um, uh, yeah, again, shocked by the uh, chaotic nature of the uh, British negotiation to leave, both under Theresa May and her failure to find a governmental majority, and then under Boris Johnson with signing up rather rapidly to a revised deal and then uh, quickly getting around to starting to unpick it, particularly in the Northern Ireland Protocol. And of course, threats to break into national law uh, were also um, very disturbing. On the French side. And apart from the, the position that the French took in the, in the UK EU negotiations, Brexit has disturbed a number of sensitive, fragile parts of the UK French relationship, um, very obviously fishing around the Channel Islands, which has always been a touchy subject, um, has been disturbed by Brexit. Um, the defence relationship defence industrial relationship, which we, um, David will well remember at Lancaster House in 2010, we launched a very ambitious UK-French defence industrial relationship, which has now largely run out of steam. And that is, uh, I'm afraid, largely because of Brexit. Um, they're not by any means only uh, fault on the British side, the position that the French took on the Galileo satellite programme, for example, early on, um, was uh, dumped a large uh, cold water bath on um, the negotiations. Um, and I think even the migrant, the small boat migrant problem uh, in the channel is also Brexit related in the sense that um, the difficult wider political relationship makes it really hard to handle specific issues where trust and confidence are in play uh, as in the channel. And just the word confidence brings me really to the personal relationship which I see between Emmanuel Macron and the Prime Minister, I think now that is in bad shape. At the beginning, when Boris Johnson was elected, I think Macron was intrigued um, by Boris Johnson's obvious political momentum, his enormous electoral success, but the relationship soured. Um, and I think now that, that Emmanuel Macron has really lost confidence in uh, the British Prime Minister. There have been too many occasions um, where they felt that uh, his, he hasn't kept his word, that um, things said between the two of them have then been misrepresented in press briefings afterwards. Um, and the threats to break into national law have certainly done nothing for the, for the atmosphere either. Um, into that mix then came the AUKUS deal with Australia uh, over uh, nuclear powered submarines. Now that may be um, strategically a good idea in the long term in terms of our Indo-Pacific policy. But I really don't think it, it needed to have been handled in a way which left the French feeling humiliated and excluded from an area where they see that they have a major role as a significant Western player in the Indo-Pacific. Um, and I contrast the response to that of the Americans where President Biden very quickly um, switched into damage limitation control, um, reached out to Macron, sent his Secretary of State and his National Security Advisor to Paris. And the British reaction, which seemed to be to double down um, on the um, exclusion of France to the point of the Prime Minister uh, mocking Emmanuel Macron in public. So that has left, I think, um, a bad taste in, in mouths in Paris. And therefore, when the British government uh, briefed the press that they want to have a major new UK-French defence treaty to reset the relationship. I'm afraid the reaction in Paris has been um, rolling of the eyes. Um, 
And my advice to the current team in government is don't produce now major new ideas for reset. Wait till after the French presidential election. And in the meantime, dial down the rhetoric, work to build confidence so that we've got a foundation on which we could then, I hope, move on to repair things. But anything done now, I think, will, will be brushed aside. So that's a way of transitioning, I think, to the, to the other um, exam question that I was set, which is um, the French election uh, in April, uh, now very um, coming up very quickly. <clears throat> Just before coming on the call, I looked at the latest poll of polls to see how the candidates were faring. Uh, Macron is where he has been pretty consistently through the election campaign at around 25% in the first round. Le Pen at 17, Valérie Pécresse, the centre-right um, candidate, 16. Eric Zemmour, this uh, controversialist, um, uh, what do you call him, media personality, at 13. Mélenchon on nine. And then the two candidates of the, of the centre-left, uh, the Green candidate, uh, Yannick Jadot on seven, and Anne Hidalgo on a pretty humiliating 4%. So a couple of points to draw out from that. Um, it is, I think, quite striking that after four very difficult years of his mandate, Macron is still at about the same uh, polling figure as he was in the first round in the 2017 election uh, on 20, 25%. But there are also some high negatives for Macron. Um, there are a lot of people who are personally very, very um, uh, bitter about his presidency. And that, I think, could have implications when we come to the second round, which I'll come on to in a moment. The far right is split between Le Pen and Zemmour. Um, if Zemmour pulled out, which is quite possible because he is clearly not going to win, um, nominally that would give uh, Le Pen something as high as 30% of the um, of the votes in the first round. But actually, I think Zemmour has also drawn a lot of votes away from Mélenchon on the far left, this being the kind of uh, against everything uh, school. And so if Zemmour dropped out, I would expect Mélenchon's score to go back up again as well. Um, on the centre right, uh, Valérie Pécresse, um, the president of the Ile de France region of France, has emerged as a strong, very credible candidate, in my view. She's an experienced minister, had a number of portfolios under Sarkozy. Uh, a very experienced politician. She would, of course, be the first woman president of France if elected. And I think of all the possible centre-right candidates, uh, Pécresse was probably the most dangerous for Macron. Um, and then the left are in the mess that they've been for the last five years and look, don't look to be serious contenders in this race at all. So um, if um, Zemmour pulls out, uh, then I think it is very likely to be uh, Macron versus Le Pen again, as in 2017. If Zemmour stays in and splits the far right vote, then I think it's quite likely that Valérie Pécresse will be in the second round against Macron. And the polling there suggests that it would be a close outcome. Um, the latest poll I saw talks about 40, 50, 53, 47 in favour of Macron in a Macron versus Pécresse race. I'm not too sure it would be um, that far apart, actually. I think she could run him very close and could quite conceivably win. Uh, if Zemmour um, uh, quits, uh, then we have Marine Le Pen in the second round. And then I think it's a pretty um, significant victory for Macron. Although remembering his negative score, uh, I think it would be closer uh, than in 2017 when it was 66 to 33. So. Uh, that's my prediction that the two likely uh, candidate to winners would be either Macron or Pécresse. And if it's Valérie Pécresse, what does that mean for the UK-French relationship? Just very briefly, I, mean, I don't think it means any major shift. Um, she is a less fervent European than Emmanuel Macron. Uh, she wouldn't carry his baggage from the Brexit era. I think she would want, in principle, to look to improve UK-French relations again. She certainly has no particular animus against the UK, but that would be far from the top of her agenda. Uh, there are many other issues that would come first, not least, of course, the relationship with the new German Chancellor uh, and with uh, President Biden. Um, so I think for London, it would be a question of building trust and confidence with her 
that there was a real interest here in uh, a better, stronger governmental relationship uh, and not expecting her to make that a very early priority. But over time, there must surely be a prospect of things improving. So David, there's a very quick run around the track um, and I'm delighted to take up um, any aspect of that that um, people have. Thank you very much indeed, Peter. Before, before I go to first question, just again a reminder, um, please um, signal preferably <coughs> just through the chat function that you would like to be called and we will call as many people as possible. Before I move to the first question, um, I claim chairman's privilege just to <coughs> probe a bit further on the, the French election. I, two things occur to me, Peter. The first is um, the, to ask to, to what extent will Valérie Pécresse be able to really forge unity amongst the Republican <coughs> behind her candidacy, given how riven that party has been between the different barons and claimants in the last few years? And secondly, what on earth has happened to the left mm. in French politics? I mean, France seems to be going the way that for a time mm. of Italy went, and Poland has gone, whether Poland the left <coughs> be marginalized whereas in germany you you've got a resurgent mm. social democrat and social democrat and green uh grouping uh, within german opinion that, that has seems to have recovered its position and this is much more full of enthusiasm why the difference <laughs> yes um well on, on valerie pecres um as i say i think she she um was underestimated uh, in the media before she came out of that um, centre-right primary as the, as the winner. Um, and yes, there are baronies on the right, but it's been quite impressive to see how everyone has coalesced around her. And they know that that is essential if they're going to win power. It would then, of course, be interesting to see the outcome of the National Assembly elections that always follows a, a French presidential election and whether she can also constitute herself a majority there. But you know, I think by becoming president and having all the patronage available to her, especially if she can then uh, win a outright majority in the National Assembly, so she can appoint a centre-right administration, she'll have plenty of jobs to offer around to the barons of the centre-right, and I think could be a very effective candidate. So um, I think that the, the right were in a real mess when Fillon crashed out of the uh, election five years ago. They have found a way of uniting in a way that the left completely haven't. The, the, the left are atomized over any number of sort of smaller movements, personality-based movements. I think the center of gravity of the French public has moved to the right in the last decade. Um, and I'm sure there are all sorts of reasons for that. I think one is um, the mix of uh, concern about immigration and terrorism. Of course, France, like the UK, has suffered you know, some, some terrible terrorist outrages um, and immigration has been blamed by quite a large part of the French public. Uh, that's the basis of the Le Pen and the Zemmour uh, vote. And I think that has moved the center of gravity. And Macron did an extremely effective job of stealing the left's clothes in 2017 and they've never really recovered. Um, and they are still in a complete mess. And with Mélenchon, who is you know, a pretty incredible candidate really, leading the pack uh, among the, the coalition of the French left is a very, very different position from Germany, as you say. And I don't see any sign of them reviving the classic French Socialist Party as the main flag bearer of the left anytime soon. Thank you. Um, I'm going to go first to Mike Cashman. <clears throat> Thank you, David. Um, last time I was in the room with you, you were saying you didn't want to be prime minister. Um, and, and a good friend of yours <laughs> assured me that they were sincere. Uh, I wish you had been, but we got somebody else instead uh, with the results that um, Peter Ricketts has described. So my question is, to what extent can UK France and UK EU relationships be improved by a new UK prime minister? A new UK prime minister. A new UK prime yeah. minister, which I expect um, that we will have this year. <clears throat> well, I leave the prediction to you. Um, uh, my own judgment is that it's going to be very hard to improve the relationship significantly with this prime minister. Uh, of course, I mean, speaking uh, in the presence of David and, and no doubt other politicians on the call, politicians are pragmatic people. Um, any president of France will need to get on with any 
Prime Minister of the UK, but all the warmth and confidence and trust has gone out of that relationship now. And I think it doesn't come back simply because there's a change of president in France. So uh, I think my answer is there is only a limited room for improvement with the current ministerial team in place, in my view. Um, and it would not take a change of prime minister and a real effort on the part of the entire you know, British political class to get back on terms with France in a major way before it would be worth thinking about, for example, big new defence treaties. And the Lancaster House Treaty of 2010, as David will remember, was based on quite a lot of work by the Conservative opposition um, before they came to power in 2010 with the French, so that there was quite an alignment of view on all sorts of issues, nuclear issues, defence industrial issues, operational defence issues, so that we could quite quickly concoct a couple of treaties um, once the government was in power. And I don't think that that bedrock of mutual confidence and a common ground is there at the moment. No, thank you. David, you're muted. Morning, <clears throat> Ian, just unmute yourself and, and that's it. Hello, um, <laughs> Lord Ricketts. So following on precisely from what you've just said, um, I am partly live in France and have been involved in some discussions on the Franco-British defence relationships and been questioning a few people. So my mm -hmm. question is, what is the future in your view? Obviously, given the present prime minister with a possible new regime, but in any case it exists, what is the future of the Franco-British combined joint expeditionary force set up in 2010 by the Lancaster House Agreement? And uh, in which circumstances do you recommend that it should be deployed? Because it, with the Franco-German Brigade, is the only true, you might say, European force in existence. And as you say in your Hard Choice book, there is a, a fundamental real politique for France and Britain to work together if, if Russia starts pushing its luck a bit too far. Well, thank you, Ian. And I basically, I agree with you. Um, I hope that the military to military cooperation, that part of the defense relationship, um, is the most insulated from the political bad weather. And I think it is. Yes. I think the two armed forces like working together, they trust each other, they're familiar with each other. And crucially, they and the politicians know that, you know, when the chips are down, yes. if a military force was needed, uh, some sort of military operation, it would be the French and the British doing it. It wouldn't be the French and the Germans. I mean, with great respect to our German friends, you know, they need a month's worth of argument and negotiation in the Bundestag before they can deploy German forces anywhere. So any use of armed force by European countries would be spearheaded by the British and the French. I think both sides know that. Um, and the, um, the two armed forces are natural allies similar size, nuclear weapon states, maritime states, with a history of willingness to intervene when necessary abroad. I think all of that is behind the combined joint expeditionary force, which as you say, it's, it's packets of, of units on both sides who train together, exercise together, never quite know what language they speak, but they, they get on well and they're ready to go and fight if necessary. And, and if I may interrupt, they have, there is apparently about 100, between 50 and 100, you can confirm it, it's public information, of officers embedded in both armies. So British yes. officers <coughs> embedded Correct. in command in the French units and vice versa throughout Correct. the arm, or the different bits of the armed forces. Do, do you confirm that? I can't confirm the figure, but yes, there are exchange officers embedded in the fighting forces of the two countries. Yes, absolutely. And there have been for actually for many years. Yeah. How it would be used, I mean, that will be to, up to the, to the governments to decide. There would have to be, of course, you know, a major um, common interest in, in deploying a force. My guess is it would be more likely to be used in a sort of disaster relief um, evacuation, um, dealing with a hurricane or an earthquake or something in the first place, rather than going and doing a kind of, you know, what do they, the military call it, opposed entry, you know, mm -hmm. into, into, a, into a fighting. 
or it could be into some sort of peacekeeping operation. You know, the British and French have been working closely in, in Mali together. So I think it would probably be short of open combat, but there are plenty of military roles short of that where the CJEF might be the right shape tool for the job at some point in the next five years. I certainly hope so. Many thanks. Thank you. Uh, Adam Isaacs, please. <clears throat> Thank you. It's just a question I didn't think to needed to be asked directly. It's just um, we suffer from having good sources, um, English language sources on what's going on in France. Um, we're particularly plagued by the spectators commentary, which just seems to promote whoever is the far right candidate du jour. Um, can you tell us who we should be reading so we can actually have informed commentary um, if our French language skills aren't up to the job? Thank you. In terms of English language commentary on what's going on in France? Yep. Did you mean? Yep. Yes. Well, I think my favorite British correspondent in Paris, um, who I would certainly trust, is Sophie Pedder, the um, economist correspondent in Paris, who's been there many, many years, and he's married to a Frenchman. Uh, he's an absolutely first rate analyst of France. So I would listen very carefully to everything that Sophie Pedder writes and says, and she's frequently. Um, interviewed in the media as well. Um, uh, there are other there are other correspondents there. Charles Bremner for the Times. Somebody else that I rate very strongly um, is a chap called John Litchfield, who used to write for the Guardian and the Independent from France. Is now retired in France. Very very active on Twitter. If you I don't know if you if you look at Twitter, but um, he he has an active Twitter account and he writes for something called the Local, uh, which is I think is an English language French. And paper published in France in the English language. John Litchfield is a very wise um, head for uh, commentary on France as well. So they're probably the, the go-to people I would, I would look at first for what's happening in France. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, because I know he has to go early. I'm going to Tim Kirkhope. Thank you very much. And uh, I very much liked hearing from Peter and his, uh, his knowledge is really expansive. Hello, Timothy. But, Great to see hello. you. Nice to see you. The Franco-German Brigade did remind me of the fact that when they alternated their uh, commanding officers, uh, everybody preferred to have a French commanding officer because when he was in place, he always brought his chef with him, I believe. <laughs> uh, anyway, the question I've got is on security. Uh, in the House today, in the House of Lords today, Lord Goldsmith, in answer to a question, was going on and on about how we had replaced the original agreements that uh, Peter and I know very well for the exchange of information, criminal information and the like, uh, with uh, new arrangements in place. Now, I'm away from that committee now, but I just wonder, Peter, whether you can fill us in on that. Is this, this bilateral approach to the British government, which seems to favor the Germans, not the French, but this bilateral approach doesn't seem to be filling the gaps in terms of security and information that we need to have. Is, have you any further views on this as to where we're getting with that? Um, well, thank you very much. And Timothy and I sat on a, on a Lords committee looking at EU justice and home affairs until sort of March, April, Tim, when, when, when it was disbanded. Well, no, I don't think bilateral exchanges of information and police data and alerting and all that, that doesn't really make any sense at all in a, in a Europe where uh, the criminals are crossing borders you know, more easily than British subjects at the moment. I mean, there were, as, as we worked out together, some workarounds that were in the trade and cooperation agreement in some of the areas where we work with the European security authorities. They do seem to be working in a in a reasonably good pragmatic way. There are some big gaps for the, uh, the big Schengen information system, the data um, alerting and exchange of, uh, of information we are excluded from, and there's never been a very satisfactory replacement for that. And things like the European arrest warrant, the success of that is, is not working, I think, as well as and as smoothly as the European arrest warrant used to. So there's been a definite loss of capacity for the British law enforcement to plug into European counterparts, mitigated by good operational cooperation you know, between the police forces themselves where they can do that. But it's, it's far from satisfactory, uh, really. And you know, one hopes that this is only a platform on which we can build uh, better cooperation in the years to come. 
Thank you. Um, I'm going to take two questions I think are complementary here. Um, so can I come first to Charles Pannock, and then before Peter replies, go to Keith Best. Good evening. Um, Lord Ricketts, um, you mentioned immigration or migration being an issue in the French presidentials. Of course, it was a big issue, sadly, uh, also within, uh, within Britain during the Brexit referendum regarding freedom of movement. My question was very briefly, what chances do you give for the Latouke trilateral agreement with Belgium and France and the UK to survive uh, the new presidency uh, and which candidates would support it? Because for what I've been reading, most of them would be quite keen to uh, dismantle it. And what consequences would that have for irregular migration across the channel in future? And my last quick tongue in cheek question is, do we need a new Entente Cordiale and who, who should be the best person to leave that? <laughs> and and uh, Keith? Uh, yes, thank you very much. I mean, we go frequently to, uh, we used to go frequently to our house in, in northern France, but uh, for obvious reasons, not being able to do it recently. And of course, we see all the barbed wire and the gendarmerie and everything like that that's been assembled around Songat, uh, all paid for by the British taxpayer with another 54 million announced recently. Um, and yet that hasn't stopped really anything. Uh, in fact, it's exacerbated the situation of irregular uh, migration. My question is about Dublin 3. Of course, with the departure from the EU, we lost Dublin 3. So we're now in the unenviable position that uh, we're, we're not able to return any um, failed asylum seekers to any country unless we have a bilateral agreement with them. Mm -hmm. And I just wondered uh, what your feeling was about any prospect of that um, being concluded bilateral with France in whatever situation may be thrown up by the, uh, the, the April presidential elections. Very good. Keith, I, your, your backdrop is wonderful because you appear <laughs> with the European stars like a halo around your head, which is very impressive. Um, Charles, well, the Touque, of course, is more than just about the migrant traffic across the channel. I mean, the Touque Treaty is the foundation of the juxtaposed controls as well, which enable the fantastic movement of people and goods um, across the channel. I mean, the goods is more difficult now after Brexit, but we used to count in the embassy something like 12 million visits by British people a year to France. That's not 12 million people necessarily, because many of us make more than one journey, but a vast movement of people and of freight across the short straits, uh, Dover, Calais, uh, enabled essentially by Le Touque and the fact that the controls are operating the way they do uh, in, the, in each other's country and as fluid as possible. And so if Le Touque was scrubbed out of, uh, as, a, as a part of a wider collapse of confidence between Britain and France and exasperation over the handling of migrants and so on, there will be enormous implications in terms of the operation of the Channel Tunnel, Eurostar and uh, Eurotunnel, um, and indeed the, the ferry traffic as well. Uh, and on the migrants and the uh, continued exasperation in both sides, I mean, I've lived that now for years. I mean, there was a big peak in 2015. Uh, if you remember, it was in the run up to the 2015 elections when we had both migrants blocking um, the Euro Tunnel Terminal, and also French seamen blocking the Calais port over the collapse of a French ferry company. And there were 20 mile tailbacks quite regularly for a few weeks. That is the occasion for all that barbed wire around Coquel, the Euro Tunnel uh, Terminal, and then the uh, Port of Calais. Um, but uh, con continuing with Charles's point, Politicians in northern France have long been exasperated by the uh, build-up of migrants uh, in their communities who want to go to the UK, don't want to be in France, and are bottled up in France. And French politicians have constantly come back to the issue, perhaps we should just scrub the whole thing and let the migrants across to the UK. And they've always rejected it on the grounds that if they did that, I mean, the magnetic effect of pulling another 10,000 people to northern France to try their luck across the channel would be irresistible. And so although it's an unsatisfactory arrangement, perhaps both in Britain and in France, it's the least bad one available. And French cooperation has continued. And I think that that will stay the same. I think whether it's Macron or Pécresse 
when they look again at the issues after the election, they will see there's no other alternative to cooperation. Um, and to come on to Keith's point, I think that's true of the UK side as well. Yes, we paid for the security fencing around the port and the Eurotunnel. The French provided thousands of gendarmes, have done now for many years, to effectively police the British border in France and to stop migrants who want to get out of France and come to the UK from doing that. And that is a bargain we've struck and it's held, although it's under pressure at the moment. And in the end, there is no other alternative than to continue to try to work to make the border as secure as possible to show migrants there's no point in trekking across Europe and trying to come across the channel um, because uh, most likely you won't succeed. When they are succeeding, as they are at the moment with the small boats, they've moved to the small boats because it's now impossible to jump on the lorries going onto ferries or to scramble over the wire and get onto Eurotunnel trains, um, then, then the magnetic effect comes back. And we had a Home Office Minister talking to our Lords Committee this afternoon, Baroness Williams, saying we want to do returns, uh, i.e. returns to unsafe European countries um, where migrants had been before coming to the UK. Trouble is, now, as you say, we're outside the EU, we're not in the Dublin process, and I don't think any EU country sees a great attraction in negotiating a bilateral returns agreement with the UK, which would be one way, because they, they won't be in a position to um, send migrants uh, back to the UK the other way, and I, that, that's unlikely to be possible, and a returns agreement that just simply means that Britain can return uh, failed asylum seekers to European capitals will not run. Uh, so we're in a bind there, and we've got to try and enlarge the package and all try and do more to close down these trafficking routes before people get to the northern French beaches. When they're there, the problem is a very, very difficult one. Uh, you're muted, David. Um, I've got Oliver down next. I haven't got a surname. Is it, is it Oliver Jakes? That, uh, uh, yes, it is, yes. So please, far away. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, um, do, do you think the French government has been effective uh, to date in combining its kind of central role as a key power in the EU with its competence in bilateral re uh, relations uh, to its advantage in its dealings with the UK? And, and uh, if so, I mean, do, do you see that continuing as a kind of French strategy going forward? Thank you. Well, um... I think, to turn it around the other way, I think the British government's hope that they could maintain a difficult, remote relationship with the EU and cultivate good individual relations with countries like France and Germany has pretty much failed. I mean, I think the, the current bad state of the relationship shows that that has not worked. And from the French point of view, with Britain leaving the EU, it has diminished Britain's value and importance to Paris quite a lot. Of course, there are some areas, we were talking about defence, where Britain and France are natural allies and closer than any other two European countries. In foreign affairs, we both sit on the UN Security Council as permanent members together, and there are areas where Britain and France work very closely together. But the centre of gravity of French foreign policy has you know, shifted towards Germany and the EU, first and foremost, and Britain only when it suits France to do that. So yes, the French will of course um, keep their options open and sometimes they will find it useful to work with the Germans and us in a E3 grouping, sometimes with the Americans as well in a, what they call the Quad, um, US, UK, France and Germany. Um, but this will all be on the basis of a lot of prior discussion with Germany on pretty much every issue and the British, I think, are downgraded as a partner of choice for France in most of those areas. Um, it's only in particular niche areas, we've talked about some of them. Energy is another one, where of course there's a very, very close UK-French energy relationship, not least with EDF building our new nuclear power stations. But in many areas, I'm afraid, we've, we've come down the pecking order in terms of French priorities. I think you can see that also in the media coverage as well, where. Um, France is still an enormously big subject in the British media, but um, those on this call who live in France, I think, will agree that the UK is not such a big issue by any means in the French media. Thank you. Um, Robert Morland.
<laughs> Robert, are we? Um, I've, I'm muted, I hope. Um, yes. Uh, I, I was going to say, Lord Ricketts, that uh, you may be pleased to hear in the light of your original comments that I, as a former MEP, get to a number of meetings still around Europe. And the one thing I, and around the world, and constantly I've had, the one thing we miss, you know, in, in, from Britain, and obviously this comes particularly from civil servants, but obviously also from ministers, is the UK Foreign Office. It is superb. And council of ministers. And indeed in Slovenia in, in the summer, I was told how much we miss you in terms of the whole problems of the former Yugoslavia. <laughs> um, so my obvious question from that would be, are you now happy that to some extent our negotiations with the European Union have moved back to the Foreign Office? I don't mean in the political, well, I do mean a bit in the political sense, but that the Foreign Office now has more role with it. Um, could you comment? <laughs> Yes, uh, absolutely. And first of all, well, thank you for what you said about the Foreign Office. I think it's true that we have a very good reputation as pragmatic problem solvers, uh, not just around Europe, but around the world as well. And I do hope after this sort of four or five years of navel gazing over Brexit, that Britain can indeed be back. Um, I'm not a great fan of the global Britain uh, slogan, personally, but if the aspiration is for Britain to be uh, getting stuck into trying to bring solutions to some of the world's problems, then that is great. And there is still an enormous pool of talent in the Foreign Office, as, as David knows. Um, so yes, I think that's very good. And I, therefore, I do think it's right that the handling of European policy should come back into the Foreign Office, really. Um, of course, Prime Ministers have always taken a close interest in that. And there's always been a coordination function in the Cabinet Office. But I think running a real negotiation uh, with the EU with all the read across to all the other policy issues that it has, its natural home is in the Foreign Office with the Foreign Secretary backed up by the expertise that we have in the Foreign Office. And the Lord Frost operation, a kind of very much a kind of solo operation based in the Cabinet Office, floating pretty free as far as I could see of, cabinet, of uh, Foreign Office advice. I don't think that worked. I don't think there was a good um, lash up of the system. So I, I think it is an improvement, yes, that it comes back into the Foreign Office and can be dovetailed with other foreign policy priorities. Uh, and at least in the head of the Foreign Secretary, you know, a, a balance struck between, um, you know, how far to push things with the EU as against where we have massive interests with the EU, whether it's on Russia or climate change or in the Balkans or whatever, because foreign policy is always about balance of, of competing interests and priorities. And that's best done in the Foreign Office. Thank you. Edward de Mesquita. Um, yes, I, I, I've been Brexiteers, which happens from time to time. One of the most infuriating things that comes up is their inherent fear of Europe <clears throat> becoming a federal state. Now, I live in France half the time, and it's hard to find anybody in France who has the slightest appetite for being part of a European state. I just don't understand it. I mean... <laughs> Only that, but most of my friends in Paris, they like to take their holidays in France. Um, every broadcast on television, the president starts Française, Français, and the products, they all have, you know, élevage en France. It's the French are very French. I can't see the French wanting to be part of it. I just wonder what your views were. On. No, well, I totally agree with you. I mean, I've lived in France on and off for 30 years. You know, it's a pretty nationalist country. You know, they're very proud of their national symbols of sovereignty. Um, some of them are slightly different to ours. I mean, you know, they've given up the franc, um, uh, you know, but the flag and the nuclear weapons and the history and the traditions and the protocols. There is a very, very strong national tradition in France, of course, as there is in Italy, as there is in Spain, as there is in Germany. And so I'm afraid that, that the... <clears throat> The, some of the rhetoric from Brussels over the years, and, and many of you on the call will know this better than me, the Brussels rhetoric is not taken seriously, mostly across the EU. I mean, people know, you know, ever closer union and so on. That's all part of the kind of rhetoric, but, but nobody takes it. It's only really taken seriously in parts of the British press and, and yes. political life where people seem to think that it might be true. It's never been true. 
and the French would be horrified by the idea of giving up their national symbols and their national prerogatives. So um, yes, the French can live with a certain degree of European rhetoric while hanging on to their um, national traditions. Emmanuel Macron sometimes takes it a bit far, even for most French people, and that's part of the reason why there's been such a strong pushback against him. Um, and you know, the Commission take it even further. But you're quite right. I mean, there's absolutely zero prospect of the EU moving in a more integrated direction, in my view, uh, not least because countries like Hungary and Poland you know, would never allow it anyway. So that is a chimera which has occupied a part of British politics far more than I think it does in, in France or, or, as I say, in Germany or Italy. John Bowis. Yes, thank you. I'm, I'm tempted to add a rider to your response on the, uh, on the issue of the Foreign Office by saying perhaps not under the present Foreign Secretary, but I won't ask you to go down that route. <laughs> I, um, I, I, I'm more interested in, in hearing your views on uh, on the triangle of uh, Britain, France in particular, and the US. Um, mm. We, of course, have seen, as you said, the Australia-US-UK um, deal upsetting Macron in France. Um, we equally have seen Biden upsetting not only the UK, but other EU countries with their chaotic and unilateral withdrawal from Afghanistan. Mm. And I just wonder if this means, in, in, in your view, that uh, we can stop talking about special relationships Biden's more interested in the uh, triangulation of his own country uh, than, uh, than internationally. Uh, uh, or do you see the, this triangle, Europe, France in particular, but Britain and the US developing in a more positive way in the future? Well, it's a big, it's a big and very interesting question, isn't it? I mean, I personally have always been a bit, enough, uh, you know, not liked the, the special relationship label. And partly because I've seen British prime ministers, uh, you know, successive British prime ministers going to Washington um, and uh, everyone kind of on tenterhooks for the, French, the American president to say the right thing and to reconfirm, uh, you know, our need to have that uh, emphasized. And the Americans know they've got to say it, but they sort of say it with a bit of a smile on their face, knowing that, yeah, you know, the British need this, so we'll say it, like the French need to be told that, that they are America's oldest ally which they love as well, of course. And so the Americans trot out the, these, you know, these phrases without them really meaning anything. I mean, the, the Americans are extremely unsentimental. Um, where Britain uh, or France is of use and value to the US, then they will work very closely with us. Um, I think the, it's interesting that the Afghanistan debat, or Kabul debat uh, last August, um, the French and the British reacted in rather different ways. And I think the British... Uh, reacted by being determined that you know they'd never let Biden uh, put that much water between them and us again, uh, and trying to embrace the Biden administration even more closely. I think the French reaction was rather the opposite, that this rather confirmed what they've been saying, that you can't really trust the Americans in the end. Uh, we've got to have greater European strategic autonomy. Um, that phrase started out being about autonomy, I think, from the US in terms of um, a military capacity to exist without the US, that goes right back to De Gaulle. Under Macron, it's become much more than that. It's become standing up to China, um, technology, sovereignty, and areas of importance for European industry in the future. And I think that that trend of thinking in France, but also in Germany and elsewhere, was strengthened by what happened uh, in Afghanistan. It didn't have the same effect here in London. Um, so sorry, that's a long way of saying Yes, of course, that trilateral relationship is important. The three Western nuclear powers, um, uh, close intelligence allies, close allies on terrorism, um, and yet um, contrary pressures on all of them. America pulled strongly now towards China as the dominant force in, you know, the dominant focus of American foreign policy. France, I think, more convinced than ever that turning the EU into something like you know, a political power in the world to match its European power. And the British slightly caught between the two, but at the moment in a phase of our politics where we want to airbrush the EU out of almost every statement we make about the world. And so naturally inclined towards the Americans and some sort of idea of an Anglosphere, Indo-Pacific um, alliance of the future, which remains very vague and I think probably you know, bulks bigger in British minds than, than in those of the 
Australians or the Americans. Um, so I, I think the tendencies at the moment are pulling apart that triangle, um, but there are some pretty big fundamental underlying uh, areas of common agreement, which I hope will mean it doesn't get pulled too far apart. Malcolm Harbour. Yes, thank you, David. Um, uh, Lord Ricketts, it's a, a pleasure to hear you talk about um, uh, some of our foreign relationships, but I know that uh, through the embassy, I worked when I was an MEP and chair, particularly on internal market matters, that there was a really strong influence and engagement um, on industrial policy and single market matters. So, uh, I mean, I used to meet very, very regularly with the Deputy <laughs> Foreign Minister of France in Brussels, who was responsible for single market. Uh, and I, I just wondered what your perspective was about how we can keep these crucial relationships going, which will, which <laughs> managed outside the Foreign Office, actually. I mean, we need mm. capability in the Department of Business. And it strikes me that the two areas where we have really fundamental relations to keep up, one is on nuclear energy in particular, but mm. energy at all. And mm. secondly, now that uh, Peugeot has now formed a huge company, which has taken over Bobbool, <laughs> where they're in making a very big investment in Liverpool now, in an electric van plant, which is encouraging. But we need to keep that sort of industrial cooperation going much more really strongly. Well, uh, yes, here, here to that. Absolutely right. Um, as you rightly say, Malcolm, um, up to the point where we uh, pulled out of the EU, every single Whitehall department um, had a, a European uh, antenna, had a European network, was involved in discussions in Brussels about a whole range of uh, aspects of our national life, pretty well no area of Whitehall that was untouched by uh, relationships with other EU member states, which meant that ministers were going to Brussels all the time, having conversations not just about EU matters, but many other things as well. And we are losing a lot of that connectivity. I think that's true. Um, ministers still go to Paris and Berlin, but not much beyond, I think. Uh, it's not high on people's priority lists. There are whole areas of, of connection which are gradually pulling apart. Um, and yes, we do need to keep those going um, at a governmental level as far as possible, um, but also through parliamentary connections, um, business connections, civil society connections as well, so that Britain stays part of the wider conversation around Europe on all these issues. And I think it's one of the most upsetting aspects of Brexit from my point of view is this um, sense that, that what was a very close relationship across an enormously wide front is becoming less close uh, and people are losing personal contacts as personnel change over uh, on each side. And another area which was really important, uh, I agree with you on what you say about um, I mean, heavy manufacturing, cars and the like, um, aerospace, um, energy, vital. I mean, Airbus, don't forget, their massive wing factory in Broughton in, in Wales. But the defence industrial relationship as well. I mean, we were on track to build a common Franco-British next generation, whether manned or unmanned fighter. Now we're back to building two competing uh, versions, a Franco-German version and a British-Italian-Swedish version, where I doubt that there's a market for even one European next generation fast jet fighter, let alone two. So, you know, we're, we're once again at each other's throats in that area too. I think that's a real pity. Um, and I, I, mean, I think business probably has to take quite a lot of the momentum in trying to keep the links going pending better political times. Edward Beckham. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Peter, for an excellent um, exp uh, exposition of Franco-British uh, relations. I wonder if I could ask you about French West Africa, where we are in a supporting role uh, in terms of the security arrangements and where things seem quite close to falling apart. The combination of anti-French populism on the part of some politicians in the region and incompetent um, host governments um, in meeting jihadi violence. So it all looks rather precarious. Do you see any glimmer of hope? Well, thanks, Edward. And I look forward very much to coming to Arundel's um, later in the year. Um, it has been an area perhaps um, underappreciated in the UK of real cooperation between Britain and France. 
because uh, if you remember, Hollande launched the Mali operation in 2013, and indeed the British armed forces were the first to help out with support and C-17 flights and logistics and so on. And we've been together with the French at different levels pretty much throughout. But the French have borne an enormous burden. You know, they've been fighting uh, high intensity uh, counterinsurgency as well as counterterrorism operations since 2013. They've lost quite a lot of people. Uh, it's cost an enormous amount of money. They've had pretty limited help from elsewhere, some from the Americans, a bit from the Europeans now in, in the more in the peacekeeping and training role. But I think the combination of the time and the cost, the sapping of, of French resolve, um, and as you say, the, the pretty terrible governance that's been apparent in Mali and other countries round about, um, and the um, failure to find a way of making any really decisive blow against the, the uh, Al-Qaeda-linked terrorists who are you know, spreading in that area, has in the end push public opinion against the operation. It was it was quite a popular operation for the first years, but now it's definitely not. And the French, I think, are looking for a way out or a way of passing the ball, perhaps to the UN, for some sort of longer term peacekeeping operation. I, mean, I personally think that if we're looking for areas of security cooperation with the French um, uh, in the future, then Africa ought to be our priority. I mean, we have very much complementary interests, the Francophone African countries you know, are right next door to Nigeria, where uh, also the uh, Al-Qaeda um, linked terrorists are, are gaining ground. Over in the East Africa as well, the scope to cooperate um, in Somalia, Kenya, um, that, that sort of clutch of countries there. And that seems to be an area where Britain and France ought to be working together. Um, it ought to be an area where we could think even one day of perhaps a, a CJEF deployment together. But in Mali, I agree with you. I think the, I think the steam is going out of that operation uh, and the French are looking to hand on the lead, which after nearly 10 years of pretty um, uh, demanding and sapping operations, I think is, is understandable. But it's, you know, it's an area of natural Franco-British uh, shared interest in my view. Um, I, we, we're two minutes away from the, the deadline. Um, <laughs> If I can use 30 seconds that just to relay, I thought it was a rather sharp, nice question from Nicholas McLean, says, uh, we're used to our press being rather in your face and, and um, sort of sometimes a bit extreme in how they express their views. Do you find, did you find as ambassador the culture of the French media very different, less adversarial, or actually are we deluding ourselves about that? Um, a brief answer, yes, less adversarial. There isn't quite the same tabloid uh, tradition in France. I mean, they have some, some um, kind of shock uh, newspapers like the Canard Enchaîné, but they are mostly focused on French domestic politics and um, French media coverage of domestic politics can be very hard hitting. By and large, I found the French media more deferential um, and, and less uh, sensationalist and controversialist in covering what happens abroad, including the UK than uh, Britain versus France, even to the point where if you gave an interview to a French newspaper as the ambassador, they would send you the transcript to correct before it went out, which is a privilege one would like to have had with the British media. So yes, I think the tone is a bit different. Um, and uh, I think also the level of interest in what's happening in the UK is less, frankly, um, than is the case the other way around. Um, it can be a whipping boy occasionally when politically useful, but it's much more the case that, that you know, that's how the British tabloid likes to look on France. Peter, thank you so much for, <coughs> for giving up your time to, to speak to us and to, to mm -hmm. answer a very large number of questions. I think the, the number of people who took part, I think we had a, a, about 100 sign up and, and, and about, we were about 90 for uh, a, a sort of peak attendance during the <laughs> week. Um, so uh, that's a measure of, um, you know, the appetite that people had to, to hear from you personally and to understand more about France, about French attitudes to the world and prospects for better times for relations between this country and France. Um, uh, I hope that uh, although it is virtual, that you, you can be confident that we are all cheering and applauding uh, uh, at a distance. And, and thank you so much again. Can I say to colleagues, um, please, uh, anybody you hear or anybody you know,
who is sympathetic to the ideas of a, a stronger, more constructive relationship between the UK and the European Union and the other democracies of Europe, and who is a conservative, um, please join us, um, conservativeeuropeanforum.org. Um, the website is there. You can subscribe at a very good value online. And please join us again uh, on the 31st of January for Radek Sikorsky. In the meantime, Lord Ricketts, thank you very much on behalf of all of us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Much enjoyed it. Okay, Thank you. Everybody. Au revoir tout le monde. Au revoir. Au revoir.